What is the world's worst peacetime maritime disaster? It is not the sinking of the Titanic. It is this ship, the ill-fated Doña Paz, that just five days before Christmas in 1987, sailed into infamy with a loss of possibly 4,000 souls, many of them burned alive in this inferno at sea. Can a passenger ferry sailing in calm water end up as Asia's Titanic? Passenger ferries like the Doña Paz were among the cheapest and the most popular ways to travel in the Philippines, a country in Southeast Asia comprising over 7,000 islands. Just five days before Christmas, hundreds of people boarded the Doña Paz for a 24-hour voyage that will take them from the island of Leyte to the capital of the Philippines, Manila. The Doña Paz was authorized to carry a maximum load of 1,518 passengers. But on the night of the accident, survivors say there may have been more than 4,000 people on board. Up to four people shared makeshift cots while hundreds sat on the floor of the three-deck ship. A machine gunner and survivor of many battles in the provinces, Luzgardo Niedo was looking forward to a family reunion in Manila. It was so crowded, Luzgardo Niedo said, the Doña Paz tilted to one side. Before I rode the ship, I noticed it was tilted to one side. I told myself it must really be loaded, but it could not be avoided since it was nearing Christmas. It was really tilted. Inside the ship, there was no room for the people to move. Many of the passengers that boarded the Doña Paz were entire families with young children. It was going to be an exciting adventure for Aludia Baxal, only 18 years old. She decided to skip her Christmas party at school and join her father, Salvador, to spend Christmas in the country's capital. But only minutes into the voyage, Aludia realized the journey itself would be far from glamorous. There were so many people. We were like cockroaches or ants. There were just so many of us. People were getting restless. The children were crying and it was very noisy. There was a family beside me. I felt for the children because this family was crammed into one cot and they had so much luggage. The passengers could not sleep because there was no space to lie down. There was hardly any space to sit down. 43-year-old fisherman Salvador told Aludia not to leave their family's only cot. As Aludia guards their belongings, Salvador searched the ship for food. In the kitchen, the situation was far worse. It was a struggle to get food, so many passengers didn't get to eat. Those who were weak, old, not as alert as the rest, and those who had a hard time walking, those people went without food because they had no choice. They suffered through it. Doña Paz had an official passenger list of 1,493, with a crew of 59 on board. But the list may not have included as many as 1,000 children below the age of four, and many passengers who paid their fare after boarding. Pedro Surima was only 17 at that time. He had come aboard without a ticket. They didn't count all the passengers because the crowd just got too big. 
bago sila mag bagong bago pa lang. At first, they ask for your ticket before they let you aboard the ship. Parang take it muna bago. But later on, anyone could just get on. Matagal na eh kahit na sino, pwede na kumakyat. A lot of chance passengers were able to ride that ship. Like many other passengers, Pedro Surima's name would not appear in the ship's manifest. Also not in the passenger list were Philippine military soldiers and police units on their way home for the holidays. They came aboard in the hundreds, some still bearing weapons and wearing their uniforms. Lutgardo Niedo was one of them. There were many soldiers on board. All were headed home to their families because it was Christmas. I think uh, about a thousand soldiers died because that's how many there are in a battalion. There were many soldiers on board. I know because they were still in uniform. They walked around the ship carrying their rifles. There were a lot of them. It is believed that more than 4,000 passengers may have boarded the Doña Pass. The ship was going at a steady pace of just 26 kilometers per hour. Passengers were settling in for the night. The Doña Pass was scheduled to arrive in Manila by morning. But unknown to those on board, another vessel was heading straight at them. And this was no ordinary ship. It was a tanker loaded with over 8,000 barrels of fuel. Just five days before Christmas, the Doña Pass crashed into the record books as a disaster even greater than the sinking of the Titanic. The Doña Pass was authorized to carry 1,518 passengers, but on the night of the accident, survivors say there may have been more than 4,000 passengers crammed into the three-deck ferry. It was 10 p.m. The Doña Pass was on schedule to arrive in Manila by morning. Most passengers were getting ready to sleep. But another ship, the MT Vector, was heading straight towards the Doña Pass. Aboard with his daughter, Aludia, Salvador Baxal saw the ship coming. I was standing on the side of the ship near the gangway. I was peeing. I noticed that ship immediately. I thought it was a fishing boat because it appeared small and with many lights. But after a while, it seemed to be getting too close to the Doña Pass. I said to myself, we're going to crash. Three close friends from the province, Almario Balanay, Generoso Batola, and Morris Apura, decided to sleep on the roof deck under the stars. Since we did not have a cot, we decided to stay on the roof deck. The three of us were on the roof deck all day until evening. We had just settled in for the night, but after around five minutes, we heard a loud sound and felt something bump into us. I heard a huge sound, almost like thunder. I immediately got up.
With no sound of alarm and without any warning from the ship's officer and crew, the Doña Paz collided with the MT Vector. The passengers inside the Doña Paz did not know that they had slammed into another ship, and it was no ordinary vessel. The MT Vector was an oil tanker carrying 8,000 barrels of gasoline and kerosene. Its bow had rammed into the port or left side of the Doña Paz, right where the engine room and main switchboard were located. The crash knocked out the engines and caused a short circuit, plunging the Doña Paz into total darkness. Military soldier Lutgarda Niedo was on the upper deck when he heard the crash. It sounded like steel going clang, clang. There was a blackout and all the lights went out. I looked at the right side of the Doña Paz. The tail end of our ship was on fire. Then I heard an explosion coming from the engine room. I kept blinking and rubbing my eyes, thinking I was dreaming. I ran to the other side and saw a smaller ship burning. We ran towards the side of the ship to see what was going on. We saw the ship burning. The fire spread quickly, and within seconds, it was everywhere. The passengers panicked, stampeding down the corridors in near total darkness. According to eyewitnesses, many of the passengers tried to escape the flames, fumes, and smoke by going deeper into the ship. They ran down to the lower deck cabins only to get lost in the maze of panic. The passengers were in total panic. They ran around maybe trying to get to their companions who were on other parts of the ship. I felt so much sorrow. Those poor people, there were so many who were going to die tonight. While some passengers were trapped inside the burning ship, hundreds of others near the ship's railings jumped overboard. I ran back to my daughter, Aludia, and told her there's a fire. Aludia slumped to the floor and started crying. I told her to be quiet, and we were going to jump overboard. It was too late to get a life jacket. There was too much smoke, which was very black. I could not breathe from the smoke. The smoke was thick, very black. I felt that I would die. I saw Papa getting ready to jump. I held on to his shoulder. He gave me a look that said, hang on, we're going to jump. They did not know that the Doña Paz had collided with an oil tanker carrying a deadly cargo of kerosene, diesel, and gasoline, and that the sea they were jumping into was on fire.
I thought to myself, this is an inferno, a fire in the middle of the sea. We would probably die here. Military soldier Lutgardo Nieto was also among the first to jump overboard. It went pshoo. Around a minute after, the ship exploded, right where the engine was. Boom. The fire became huge, followed by an explosion. The sea was on fire. Boom. The vector also exploded. The oil drums were flying, and they fell and hit the sea. Gasoline and diesel spread in the water. I felt that was it for us. All we did was to swim and swim. Every time we saw the waves that were on fire come our way, we dove deep into the water. Hundreds of passengers were able to jump overboard, including the trio of Almario Balanay, Generoso Batola and Morris Apura. They watched the last seconds of the Doña Pass. The waters surrounding the sinking ships were covered with oil, gasoline, and kerosene. They must dive into the ocean to escape the flaming surface and swim their way outside the deadly ring of fire. The fire was huge. The flames grew to almost a kilometer wide. As the wind blew, the flames grew even bigger. What I did was to stay underwater to avoid the flames. When I felt the surface was hot, I swam further away to avoid it. Finally, when I reached a safe spot away from the flames, I started to cry. I was crying, asking myself why this happened. I wanted to take the bus. If only we had taken the bus. I was grieved because I swam by the body of a child. He looked around three years old to me. His body was burnt from the fire. I touched the child's head, but his eyes were not moving. I lifted him twice, but he did not move. So I let him go. I was overwhelmed with sadness because of that. For those who jumped from a burning ship to a burning sea, the nightmare was just beginning. Under the sea, you could feel the heat from the fire above. Your body would feel it was boiling. I thought I would explode from the heat. A fisherman and experienced diver, Salvador watched helplessly as bodies float past him. He feared the worst for his own daughter, Alutia. If my child was able to jump, if she were alive, she would shout. I 
thought of killing myself. I could no longer bear being in the water. I was too tired from keeping afloat, and I had a hard time breathing. I planned to sink into the water and just drown myself. But I also kept going back up to the surface when I needed to take a breath. My face got burned, my hands got burned here, and here, here too. Suddenly, Aludia heard a familiar voice. It was her father, Salvador. I heard my father's voice. I shouted, Papa! He was shocked to hear my voice. I'm here, Alud. Where are you? I replied, Over here. Where are you? Papa was surprised that I was just near him. He grabbed hold of my hand, but it was burned and my skin just peeled right off. It was very painful. I asked him not to touch my hand. Reunited with his daughter in the burning water, Salvador felt a surge of relief and a strange sense of peace. It flashed across my mind that I was ready to die at that moment. I finally found her and heard her voice again. We could now die together. In the meantime, I vowed never to leave her side. They would swim for more than an hour in what seemed like an endless wait for rescue that was nowhere in sight. In the mild wind and calm currents, the sea kept on burning as many lives died out. I heard screaming and crying, especially when the people caught fire. Then, the crying stopped. Later, we heard moaning, and then there was silence. The sea became quiet. In the days to come, the real horror of the tragedy became clear. It is believed that nearly 4,000 passengers boarded the Doña Paz. Only 24 would survive to tell the tale. And as the search for bodies ended, the demand for answers began. It was the world's worst peacetime maritime disaster, a collision between the passenger ferry Doña Paz and an oil tanker in the Philippines. But the Philippine Coast Guard did not learn of the accident until more than eight hours later. and it took another eight hours to launch an official search and rescue operation. Luckily, help arrives in the form of a passing ship, the Don Claudio. By then, the survivors have been swimming for more than an hour. Father and daughter, Salvador and Aludia, saw the light from afar. A ship arrived. I told Papa, there's a ship. There's light. Papa said, raise your hand so they can see that there's a woman. So I did, and all the others followed. They tried to pull us up with a rope. I told them we are too exhausted. We cannot hang on to it. So they threw the net. Aludia and I climbed up using the net. 
Only aboard the Don Claudio would Salvador realize just how horribly his daughter Aludia had burned in the water. She was suffering from third-degree burns on her face and arms. Today, her right eye still bears the scar of the flames. The trio of Almario Balanay, Enroso Batola, and Morris Apura would reunite aboard the Don Claudio. I saw Morris stretched out on a dining table. His body was full of burns. He was alive and breathing, but his body was burned like charcoal. When they pulled me up, my skin started peeling off here and here. Only then did I feel the pain. The doctor told him he was burned badly and that he should lie down. I took care of him while he was sleeping. His burns were showing. In fact, some parts were dripping. Out of nearly 4,000 passengers who may have boarded the Doña Pass, only 24 survived. I'm the only soldier who survived. The rest died. I guess they drowned or were eaten by sharks. Days after the collision, the coasts of the nearest island of Mindoro were littered with bloated corpses washed ashore. Villagers dug holes in the sand to bury them. Black with burns and slick with oil, the bodies were mangled and almost naked. Small fishing boats also came to shore with bodies trapped in their fishing nets. Villages watched in grief as boat after boat arrived with their terrible catch. Grief-stricken and outraged relatives stormed the office of the Sulpicio Shipping Lines, owner of the Doña Paz. Many names of the missing would not appear in the ship's manifest. Relatives were shocked when Sulpicio Lines declares that the ferry was not overcrowded. The number of passengers as officially certified by the Coast Guard after a head count is 1,493. It is not true that uh, the vessel was overcrowded. But the lawyer for oil tanker MT Vector asserts that overcrowding on the Doña Pass was a crucial factor. This vessel is overloaded. The maneuverability of this vessel is uh, very difficult in the sense that you, you cannot uh, easily uh, move this or turn this left or right. Why? Because it may, may nice. lease. No? You're saying now that overloading may actually be a crucial yes, thing in this? Yes, it's a crucial thing. 
But this tanker did not realize that this vessel could no longer avoid avoid them, no? Because uh, all the time this uh, tanker believes that uh, it will turn, no? Yeah. But because of the difficult maneuverability of this vessel, what happened is they could not turn anymore. There were 1,493 passengers on board. Now, aside from that, the number of people on board did not have any causal connection with the collision itself. Official investigators from the Board of Marine Inquiry soon realized that answers would not come easily. All of the officers on board the Doña Pass were killed in the collision. Two crew members from the Vector survived, but both had been asleep when the crash happened. For answers, investigators looked to the past, and the Vector had an interesting history. A ship captain who had piloted the MT Vector told investigators that the steering rudder was defective and difficult to maneuver. So difficult that it took two people to manually steer the wheel. With the defective steering rudder, the vector would have approached the MV Doña Paz zigzagging like a snake in the water. The zigzagging motion would have been confusing, especially in the night when sea vessels use different colored lights to signal their position to oncoming ships. When the vector shows the green light, it indicates that it will pass by the right side of the Doña Pass. A red light would indicate that it is moving towards the left side of the Doña Pass. And the white light shows that it's heading straight on. Because the vector steered from left to right, the Doña Pass would see lights that suddenly change from red to white, green and white, then back to red and white, confusing the watch officer aboard the Doña Pass. Investigators found other disturbing problems. The tanker was undermanned and the officers and crew underqualified. The Vector's master did not have a chief mate license and was only licensed to serve as second mate. The chief engineer had no license at all and the Vector had no qualified lookout on the bridge. Investigators questioned how the Vector was allowed to sail at all. They soon discovered that the Vector had sailed without a certificate of inspection and Coast Guard license, basic documents that declare ships in the Philippines to be seaworthy. The evidence mounted against the vector, but one crucial point mystified experts. Even if the vector had approached in a winding motion, why didn't the Doña Pass simply avoid it? The international rules at sea state that if two ships are on high risk of a head-on collision, each must alter her course to starboard or right side to avoid each other. Why did the Doña Pass and Vector get too close? Commodore Benjamin Mata was himself a shipmaster before he became a leading expert in maritime safety. Uh, it's like uh, a turtle ramming into the belly of a porpoise. How that can happen is, is really puzzling to me. I cannot understand why the Doña Pass did not take evasive action and just leave this side.
The ships were moving slow. The Doña Paz at 26 kilometers per hour, the Vector at eight kilometers per hour. They were surrounded by wide open sea, plenty of space to avoid a crash. Could it be that no one was watching? The officer on watch on the tanker might have fallen asleep. In the same manner, the officer on watch on the Doña Pass also could have fallen asleep. Because why did he allow his ship to come very close to the tanker? When you have so much space on both sides to maneuver, to get out of the way of this ship that is uh, showing a different set of lights every five minutes. All the officers and crew of the Doña Paz went down with the ship, and the whole truth may never be known. Experts also wondered why the Doña Paz and Vector did not communicate with each other just before the crash. Well, that again is a requirement. It's an international requirement that all ships must be equipped with the VHF radio. In situations where ships are in sight of each other, they can use the radio to communicate and ask the other ship what his intentions are. And this should be done long before a possible collision will occur. The Vector was discovered to have an expired radio license, and the radio license of Doña Paz turned out to be fake. Unbelievably, the official investigation ruled out what could have been the most spectacular aspect of the Doña Paz tragedy. The reported overcrowding of almost 4,000 passengers on board the Doña Paz. The Board of Marine Inquiry dismissed the eyewitness account of the survivors. They ruled that the eyewitnesses were not qualified to count the number of actual passengers aboard and were just making estimates. Investigators took the word of the Philippine Coast Guard boarding team, who insisted to the very end that they conducted a proper head count. Many were shocked that Sulpicio Lines was not held liable for the possible overloading of the Doña Paz. The ruling drew howls of protest from the relatives of unlisted and still missing passengers. Families of each victim received 400 US dollars from Sulpicio Lines as compensation. Those who were not on the ship's manifest got nothing. Vector lawyer Jose Sison points out a potential conflict of interest in the official investigation. The Board of Marine Inquiry, or BMI, was under the umbrella of the Philippine Coast Guard, the same body responsible for ensuring proper passenger loads on ferries. I, I think uh, BMI can come up with that conclusion only. Uh, the BMI is under the Philippine Coast Guard. No? So the only way they could exculpate the Philippine Coast Guard is to uh, exonerate Sulpicio. Or Why? Because uh, if they find all these violations of Sulpicio, these are violations committed by Sulpicio because it was allowed by Coast Guard. But according to the Philippine Board of Marine Inquiry, even if the Doña Pass was overcrowded, this scenario had nothing to do with the collision. We have been saying all along that uh, the cause of the tragedy is not overcrowding or overloading of the vessel. The cause of the tragedy, let's face it, is the collision. Now, the center of focus should be 
who is at fault during in that collision and then uh, we go into the minor issue which is uh, overcrowding ultimately investigators put the blame on the vector But one burning question remained. Why didn't the captain and crew of the Doña Paz take evasive action? Shocking allegations later surfaced from survivors. So they were having fun? They were having fun, not the passengers. Are you talking about the first class passengers? I'm talking about the crew of the ship. In the greatest sea disaster to ever happen in peacetime, a passenger ferry collided with an oil tanker. There were only 24 survivors, and the world still looked to them for answers about what truly happened aboard the Doña Paz. But the survivors would have more questions, each more troubling than the last. Witness told investigators about the party being held aboard the Doña Paz just minutes before the crash. I heard music and laughter. I guess there was dancing up there. So they were having fun? That's what I noticed. Who was having a party? They were having fun, not the passengers. They were having fun. Are you talking about the first class passengers? I'm talking about the crew of the ship. Another survivor, military soldier Lutgardo Niedo, recalls that a fellow soldier had told him about the same party at the bridge, and that disturbingly, the captain was among them. The soldier told me that he'd been going around the ship and he was specific that he came from a party at the bridge. He said, do you know that the captain is there at the party? I thought he meant a military captain. But he said, no, I mean the captain of the ship. He's at the party. I told him not to mind so much because I'm sure a chief mate relieved the captain. But after a few minutes, we crashed. I thought to myself, what the soldier told me must have been true. Who was manning the bridge when the accident happened? Was it a qualified officer? According to some survivors, an apprentice mate may have been steering the ship. The truth may never be known. In the years after the Doña Paz tragedy, shipping disasters continue to plague the Philippines. In 1988, nearly a year after the tragedy, the Doña Marilyn, a sister ship of the Doña Paz, sank off the central province of Leyte, killing some 300 lives. Were no lessons learned from one of the world's worst maritime disasters? It has been 20 years since that fateful December day. But for the survivors, those terrible memories will never fade. These days, traveling by land or air is easy and a lot faster. So to take the ferry from Manila to Leyte, 
No. I don't want to ride a ship again. I'm afraid to get on because if it sinks, I may not be as fortunate. I'll just take the plane. It's faster. I don't want to ride a ship again. I won't, even if it's for free. As I was there watching it happen, I prayed to God that He let me live because my family needs me. They depend on me, and I promise to serve them till my last breath. They are the reason why I fought to stay alive that night.